<laughs> I'm Sam. And this is Gabe. And this is Coaster Wars. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Coaster Wars podcast, the only podcast that takes two roller coasters and compares them to each other. Why? I don't know why. That's just what we do here. <laughs> we have our Battle for the Champions uh, episode here. This is wow, our number try one to coasters. Sound a, try to sound a little less enthusiastic. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, this is our championship episode. This is number one on our list as of like July of 2023. This is the best we've ever written. We gotta hype this up a little bit more. I know, but but he- you know, I already have picked a winner for this one, uh, so I'm kind of just like, eh, yeah, whatever, we'll talk uh, about what, it, all right. Whatever. Can you just at least get excited <laughs> that we're going to talk about two cool roller coasters? One of them I know we've already talked about already, but the other one we haven't, and it looks like an awesome coaster. It does look like an awesome coaster. All right, well, why don't we get into this? Why don't you in- <laughs> in- introduce our fighters? I didn't, I didn't come here today to be taken out to the freaking dumpsters, okay? Seriously. Oh, I'm, okay, I'm sorry. I'll back off, but introduce our, <laughs> introduce our coasters. All right. In the blue corner, standing at a height of 206 feet and reaching a top speed of 76 miles per hour. Hailing from the shores of Tampa Bay, Florida, and the RMC gym, it is Iron Quasi. In the red corner, standing at a height of 181 feet and reaching a top speed of 70 miles per hour. Hailing from the trees of New Jersey and the intimate gym, it is El Toro. Let the fight begin. All right, so obviously my number one here is Iron Glossy, and it is an undisputed number one. I'm sorry it's already won the episode, but you can go ahead and talk. (laughs) And my number one is El Toro, and again, I've said this, I swear to goodness every episode, that Hershey Park drastically changes my list, and I'll just go ahead and say it. After going to Hershey Park, Wildcat's Revenge sits at the top of my list now, not El Toro, and we'll be talking about it in a future episode, but yeah, El Toro, I don't even think stands anywhere near the top, anywhere near Iron Glossy, so I hate to bring it down already, even though it's my coaster, technically. For sure. Um, Just take a second here before we get into this. One thing we forgot to do. Um, We are going to do another special episode. So what is our next special episode going to be? I don't like it, but... (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, the next one is all about about Gabe. So if you've listened to any of our previous episodes, I'm sure you probably can kind of gauge this. Gabe knows a lot more about coasters than I do. I only very, very, very recently started doing more in-depth research, really kind of the start of this podcast is when I started doing more in-depth research into coasters and the different uh, terms and the forces and kind of stuff like that. So Gabe is our resident coaster expert. So our next special episode is going to be a quiz episode and you can submit questions you might want to ask him at the uh, our email. It's coasterwarspodcast at gmail.com. And um, if you guys don't submit any questions, I'm just going to ask him a bunch of questions about shit that I want to know. Yeah, and, and this is a, this is going to be like a no dumbs questions kind of episode. Whether you're curious about a certain roller coaster or maybe my opinion on a certain roller coaster or, you know, any questions in general. It just, as long as it's roller coaster based and to the point where I can actually somewhat answer it with an honest answer um that's what we're looking for but like i said no dumb questions i mean if it's something as simple as is this roller coaster you know an rmc or what brand or what bottle i mean whatever you can think of or something maybe you're curious about but you don't feel like you want to go on google and look it up just you know shoot us the email and i'll try to answer it as best i can so 
Yeah, but with that, and we'll be plugging that a few more times. We won't, we'll have a couple more episodes in between before that special one. So we'll plug it a couple more times and you'll have, it'll give you adequate time to send in any questions you guys might have. Yes, absolutely. But with that, I think, uh, well, why don't we dive into El Toro? I think uh, we'll save the best for last. (laughs) Okay, so El Toro is uh, my number one for this list. It's at Six Flags Great Adventure. It opened in uh, 2006. And this is a, it's a wooden roller coaster, but it's a very interesting wooden roller coaster. It's an intimate prefab wooden roller coaster and basically what that means is in traditional wooden roller coaster construction what happens is is they cart in the wood it's cut and assembled on site but what intimate decided they wanted to do is they wanted to try and make a roller a wooden roller coaster that gave you a steel roller coaster experience so one of the things that they did is they decided to machine all of their wooden parts in a factory and then ship them out to the construction site and then all the construction workers had to do there was kind of fit these pieces together and an advantage to doing this is one they can then use lasers to cut these wooden pieces which makes for absolutely impeccably precise cuts on these pieces of wood and then on top of that they made them kind of like legos basically they were just pieces that could fit together which made putting this roller coaster together because it's basically what they did a super quick and efficient process yeah there there is one unfortunate thing about about the construction style of this roller coaster and um intamin prefabs in general they are very very expensive Yes. And that's why, so there's only four of them that are currently standing here in the world, only one in the U.S. And the reason for that is it's just expensive. El Toro, when it opened, uh, let me look here, was over $20 million, and that was in 2006. So for a wooden Dang. roller coaster to cost that much is kind of insane. However, you get what you pay for. Right? Yes. So yep. you're going to pay $20 million for a wooden roller coaster, but you're going to get an ultra elite roller coaster and a potential number one roller coaster ride experience. Oh, so yeah. it's one of those things. It's a, it's a give and take. It's a give and take. The other thing that they were supposed to do when they built these roller coasters is that they were supposed to be less maintenance than traditional wooden roller coasters. Um, however, I think uh, amusement parks are starting to discover that's not true. Obviously, El Toro, <laughs> with its uh, malfunctions and incidents, you know, it's very infamous in the roller coaster world for killing people. Not killing people, but injuring people. And, uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's one of those things where, you know, as the roller coaster ages, you still have to invest money into it, which Six Flags seems to refuse to do. <laughs> so it's kind of on them, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of both. It's Six Flags and it's Intamin, because Intamin did say, oh, well, there's supposed to be less maintenance involved. Well, obviously, that is not as true as everyone thought it was. Yeah, so let's go into what this ride is actually all about. You got a length of 4,400 feet of track. It's a total height of 181 feet. It's got a drop of 176 feet. It's a top speed of 70 miles per hour, and this thing is a freaking trip. I suppose I'll just go into the layout right away. So you have a turnaround into the lift hill, and into that lift hill... I mean, I can't even read my own goddamn notes. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. I was so confused about what I was what I wrote down. Okay, so you have a turnaround... Do we need to into- take you back to high school... Is that what's going on right now? I can't even read, yes. Oh my god. It took me a second to, like, just, like, think about what the roller coaster does. So, you have a turnaround into the lift hill. The lift hill brings you all the way up to that um, 186 feet, or 181 feet, sorry. And then it's got a slow turnaround um, up at that 181 feet, and then it brings you into the drop. And that's, like I said, it's 176 feet, it's 76 degrees brings you to that top speed of 70 miles per hour. And right out of that uh, drop, you have a banked curve to the right, and then another slight curve to the right, 
or brings you into two smaller airtime hills, a curve to the left. The And this, that was a really quick beginning part into what is the best ejector airtime moment on the entire ride. It is world famous. It is the Rolling Thunder Hill. And it hits you every single time. There's never, never a bad Rolling Thunder Hill. It's just amazing every time. And then you get three back-to-back banked curves over, um, which offer some amazing laterals. You get another banked airtime hill. You get a final air, and then you get one final pop of airtime that leads into the final breaks. And that is just a really quick rundown of what this freaking ride does to you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we talked about this in the last podcast. This roller coaster is very well balanced. And I think that's not something that gets talked about enough. You know, everybody says, oh, it's legendary ejector airtime. It's it's legendary ejector airtime, and, and that's what you live for on this ride. And, and that is true. Don't get me wrong. It is legendary ejector airtime. But... It is still a really well balanced roller coaster. You get some awesome laterals at the end there. You get some really good G forces as well. Um, some transition whippy moments, and I think I think that's an underrated part of this roller coaster is just the different the different elements and how they're all put together, and the fact that this roller coaster is really well rounded. Oh yeah, we talk about how this thing is an absolute pacing machine, and. We talk about, so there, at one point, isn't there, like, a double down? Is it a double down or a double up? I cannot remember. Or is it maybe just two? I don't remember. There's a part in this ride where we talk about where it's a quote-unquote dead spot, but it's only a dead spot on this specific roller coaster because everything else in the ride is freaking, is top ten amazing. So you put this one element that we're calling a dead spot on any other ride and it would be like the, one of their best elements. It's just every single thing on this ride hits you so hard and you don't have any time to breathe and stop and think about what just happened to you before you're sent into the next element. And before you know it, you're into the final breaks and you're just like, what the hell? What What even was that? It, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think you're talking about the turnaround. Um, the turnaround is what we consider to be a dead spot. The turnaround okay. and then the speed hill. So you, you pop up yeah, to the top this, and then air yeah. time and then you dive down, which you get some really good G-forces there as you're turning around and you're coming towards the ground, and then you kind of bank back up into the air, pop back up, and then there's another airtime moment. And it's those two airtime moments between the G-forces that aren't as strong as the rest of the ride. But like you said, on any other wooden roller coaster, it would be like a highlight part of the roller coaster. (laughs) And, And I think that just goes to show how good the airtime in previous moments is. And... You know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, the rest of the roller coaster is so good that there's a couple moments where we're just like, I wish it was on that level. Mm-hmm. But it, it's, it's imperfect in a perfect way, if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? Oh, because yeah. you still get, like I said, you get the balances. You get the ejector airtime and you get the floater. But it almost, the floater almost makes you appreciate the ejector even more just because, you know how weak of a moment the the other two moments are compared to the ejector airtime. It's just one of those things where, it, it, like I said, it makes the ride more complete. It's not just one force and one element over and over and over again. It's a mix of everything together, and I think that's really what makes this a standout roller coaster. Oh, yeah. Me and Gabe have talked about it previously where we... We love the airtime, but at the same time, we don't want to get bored with a roller coaster. And El Toro is definitely not that. Like Gabe was saying, is it really mixes up the forces or combines forces, puts them together in such interesting ways that it keeps you entertained for the entire ride, even through what we're calling this quote-unquote slow spot. It really is nice to have just a little bit of floater to, to do exactly what he said, to make us appreciate the amount of ejector and just rip you out of the seat force this roller coaster has on it. 
Yeah, and and one thing I do really want to stress with this roller coaster is it is sustained ejector airtime. I think that's yes. another common misconception about this roller coaster. It's because typically when you think about ejector airtime, it's maybe half a second or maybe one full second of you know a forceful moment, and then you go into the rest of the roller coaster. Well, that is not what El Toro is. El Toro is basically a B&M hyper on steroids. So, <laughs> you know how B&M hypers, you have, like, the five-second floater airtime hills, and, you know, it's sustained moments of airtime. That's what El Toro is, just on an ejector airtime level. So oh, you yeah. have three to four seconds of forceful ejector airtime on those first two camelbacks and even the uh, uh, the rolling thunder hill but the rolling thunder hill is a little bit more um short lived but it is a, it's such an aggressive moment it doesn't even matter no, it does not <laughs> so one thing i do want to stress about this roller coaster it's not comfortable there, there's not a <laughs> thing about no. this ride that is comfortable um, I'm, I don't know, a lot of people like the restraints. I absolutely freaking hate the restraints on this roller coaster. Uh, some of it is probably just by body type, but the restraints are kind of eh. And then the ejector is strong enough that it is slightly painful if you have a full train and it's running at full speed. But it's one of those things where it's kind of painful in a good way, you know what I mean? Like... Like, that's just how forceful the roller coaster is, and I think that's, um, that's something else I like about it, too. But it is rough. Don't don't get us wrong yes. here. It is a rough <laughs> roller coaster. Um, like I said, it was built in 2006. It's, you know, we're, we're getting up there in age for this roller coaster. So yeah, when, uh, when don't, you... expect, don't expect an RMC experience when you get on this roller coaster, because that's not what you're going to get. When me and Gabe went to go ride this, we appreciated how rough it was, but we said if they're going to keep running this thing, it really needs a full retrack. Uh, but again, it's out of Six Flags Park, and we're going to have to really see when and if that ever does happen for this roller coaster. I hope it does. It's an amazing ride, and I think a retracting would do it a lot of good. But again, we'll see if Six Flags ever decides to spend the money on that. So, Yeah, well, with the whole, um, the whole merger thing happening, that... It, I think it'll be on the list. I, I mean, Great Adventure, it's one of the marquee parks in the Six Flags chain. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, this is their marquee attraction at Great Adventure. So I think to keep it around, they'll probably want to retrack it at some point. Um, that's what a lot. That's what they're doing with a lot of the other older Intamin prefabs, is they've been fully retracked. So it's just something about the 15-year mark for these roller coasters that they need to be done. And El Toro is obviously past that mark, and it, it really does need a full retracking. But yeah, it's, it's still a really good roller coaster. As much as we talk about how rough and uncomfortable it is, it is still your number one coaster, and it's still my number two. So that should really tell you how good of a ride experience this really is. Oh, yeah. Um, real quick before we run out of time, because I know we're kind of running up there, we have to talk about, inevitably with this ride, we have to talk about, and I love talking about it, the intimate fart, which is the sound, the most unique sound that this roller coaster has. And, like, if you think about roller coaster sounds, especially on wooden roller coasters, first of all, they're not quiet roller coasters. And then something that I always think about with roller coasters, too, especially wooden ones, is the click of the chain as you're, like, being slowly drawn up that... That lift hill, but with intimate prefabs, you have something called the intimate fart. And I'm going to have Gabe explain it because he's better at it than I am. Well, it's basically what it is, is there's two sets of wheels on a, a roller coaster train. You got the carrier wheels and then you have the upstop wheels. So the carrier wheels carry the majority of the weight of the train as it's rolling down the track. However, when you get to an airtime moment, there has to be something that keeps the train connected to the track. <laughs> Otherwise, you'd go flying off like you're a Dukes of Hazard person or whatever. <laughs> but so what they do is they put up stop wheels on the bottom of the track. And what the intimate fart is, is when the train gets lifted up in an airtime moment violently enough, it makes a sound. And that's exactly what it is. It's just those little tiny wheels hitting the bottom of the track violently enough to make a noise. 
And um, and that's what the the quote unquote intimate fart is is those upstop wheels, but it is something it like it's loud like you can hear it yes. like it's not just like a little tippy tacky tap 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 it's a full on noise that you can hear while this roller coaster is running, and it really puts into perspective how violent those ejector airtime moments really are. Oh yeah, so just. That was one thing I wanted to cover real quick. Let's switch gears now and let's talk about Gabe's number one roller coaster because <laughs> I'm actually pretty excited myself to talk about this thing because this thing it, looks freaking awesome. Iron Glossy is the definition of quality over quantity. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, it's only 4,000 feet of track, if I am correct. 4,075 feet. Yes. So it's not an incredibly long coaster. It's a lot longer than some of the other RMCs, you know, 3,000 track, 3 feet of track, 2,900 yes. feet of track. Um, but it's not the longest. I mean, obviously, there's some B&M Hypers out there that are over 5,000. There's some Giga Coasters over 6,000 feet of track. But it's not a short ride, but it's not a long ride either. But... This takes the blueprint of a Goliath at Six Flags Great America, another personal favorite of mine, Mm -hmm. and just scales it up a little bit. And and what they did with this roller coaster is each element on the roller coaster is a standout element. Maybe there's not as many, but each element is a standout moment, a very memorable moment. Um... Iron Glossy is just, in my opinion, it's as close to a perfect roller coaster as you can get. There's a couple small little tiny issues I have with it. But for the most part, it's my number one coaster, and I've yet to ride anything that dethrones it. I mean, I got El Toro, I got Fury 325, and those three coasters, I got Maverick. That coaster as well could potentially dethrone this. I just, I don't see it. There's a couple coasters definitely on my list that I want to ride that could potentially dethrone it. But it's going to be a tough one. It's it, This is a really, really good roller coaster. I loved every minute of it. I have about 20 different rides on this roller coaster over the course of two days. And every time I rode it, it just got better and better and better. Like, this, like normally you get bored after a while of riding the same coaster over and over again. This is one where you just wanted to keep riding the roller coaster. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so one of my things is is that, like, I've heard the name Iron Glossy so many times. I've heard it from you. I've heard it from other roller coaster enthusiasts that I've talked to. I've heard it in review videos about other coasters where they mention Iron Glossy. I feel like it's whispered among roller coaster enthusiasts as, like, one of the best rides ever. So for some reason, in my mind, I had it, like, I thought it was built in, like, I don't know, 2000. Like 2015 or something, and it's been around for at least 10 years, it would be um, almost. And when I went to do research and found out that it didn't open until 2022, and like for it to have the reputation that it does, and to only have been open for literally basically a year now is absolutely insane to me and I think it does speak to the caliber of a ride that this is and uh, another story I like to tell is so I went to Hershey Park and I got to ride Wildcats Revenge which is one of the newest RMCs it's a 2023 RMC and like I said before that is now my number one coaster it's a really good one but there was a guy wearing an Iron Gwazi shirt, so I asked him, I'm like, well, is this better or Iron Gwazi? And he told me Iron Gwazi, and another guy told me that, no, Wildcat's Revenge is better. So it really, I, and I loved Wildcat's Revenge, so if this is potentially better than that, it has to be an amazing roller coaster. Yeah, well, Wildcat's Revenge is handicapped a little, because I think the max height on Wildcat is like 140 feet. Where well, this one just, is 206 yeah. feet. <laughs> I just looked it up and it's shorter too. It's only 3,000, or 3,500 feet of track. So that's another thing killing Yeah. Me. And, and, and that's the thing I like to talk about Iron Gwazi. It's 206 feet tall. I think the drop's 204 feet maybe. Something like I, that. What I saw is it's exactly 206. Is it? Mm-hmm. I couldn't remember. Okay. Well, yeah, sure. We'll go with that. Um... <laughs> uh, <laughs> But, so, it has the allure of the whole hyper-hybrid thing as well. 
um, which I think there's three of them now. You've got Steel Vengeance, which is the first. You have Iron Gwazi, and then you have Zadra over in Europe, which is another hyper hybrid, which is supposed to be really, really good. <laughs> um, but this one, for me, has my favorite inversion of all time on it. One of the best drops of all time. One of the best Outer Banked Airtime Hills of all time. And then just a relentless pacing filled layout that does not have a mid course bank run. And I think that's the biggest difference for this one over Steel Vengeance that really affects it for me. Is there's no mid course break run. There's no kind of dull or dead spot while you go through the breaks and then it slows you way down and then you have to gain your speed again. This one does not have that. And what that does is it takes the pacing of a Steel Vengeance and turns it up even just a little bit more because there's no break in it. I think that's what I really, really love about this roller coaster. It's just the pacing, the elements, and the way it's all put together is just so good. So good. <laughs> <laughs> when So when we talk about RMCs, we do, I think it's good to mention the ride that they've replaced and this one actually was really interesting to me because before Iron Gwazi was it or is what it, or oh my god I cannot talk became what it is today. It was originally Gwazi and it was a GCI dueling roller coaster, which I just thought was super interesting. It was originally built in 1999 and it operated until 2015, and then there were construction plans released in 2018 for construction that was going to be done in 2020 and then of course we had the pandemic so that's part of the reason why the coaster wasn't released as um until it was is it just had problems all over the place but to just to talk about the coaster that it replaced guazi sounded itself like a really good coaster and to, for it to be dueling, I felt like it had then gave RMC a really good footprint to work with as well. Yeah, well, the, the problem with wooden roller coasters in the state of Florida is they don't last. Um, and and uh, I believe the original Guazi was like the only wooden roller coaster in the state of Florida. And there's reasons for that, because... Florida weather, you know, hurricanes and the humidity, it just destroys the wood. And uh, so it's kind of amazing that they were able to still build something like this out of that. But they get a little cheap because they can use the steel track mm -hmm. and the slight little bit of steel supports they use underneath the track to get away with, you know, Florida weather. But mm -hmm. um, let's dive right into this layout quick before we, we get too far. So... <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, it starts with a 206-foot drop, which is one of the best in the world. I think it's 92 degrees or something like that. So it is beyond vertical. And you can feel that. You can feel that in the drop. It is so good. And then you drop down into the first pullout, which has a nice little twist to it. This is the only other pullout that I've ever grayed out on. It pulls some forces. And that pops you up into the Outer Banked Airtime Hill. This is the one element where I'll say Steel Vengeance probably does it a little bit better. But it is still a really, really, really good moment and one of the more standout moments on the roller coaster. After that, you dive down into another twist to the left before popping up, twisting to the right, and entering the best inversion of all time, and that is the death roll. So what is the death roll, you ask? It is a barrel roll pointed at the ground. So you are gaining speed as you are entering it and exiting it. And in the back row, you get an insane amount of whip. I mean, it is just crazy. It is such a good element. After that, you pop up into kind of a... It's an overbank. I, I don't even know what to call this. Like, you're almost upside down, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> but it's another airtime moment. It's pretty good. Um, and it has some pretty good transitions in and out of it before popping up into the wave turn that goes over the station, which is another standout moment. I'd say this is even better than the Outer Bank Airtime Hill at the beginning. And then you dive down, pop up to the left, and you kind of go up into another kind of like a mini wave turn type thing. It's pretty good, but not as good as the first. Before popping up into a stall which is kind of short, but you still get some really, really good transitions in and out of it. 
And you still get, you know, the zero-G stall part of it. It's just a little bit short for me. Before diving down and popping up into a kind of a double-up, I guess you could call it. And then it kind of has a trick track type thing. Those who've ridden Wicked Twister would know what I mean by that. Before turning it all the way back towards the final airtime moment, which is the drop into the final breaks. And that is the best airtime moment on the entire ride. It is in the back row. It is absolutely insane ejector airtime. Almost on the same level as the Rolling Thunder Hill. Not quite, but pretty damn close. And then you roll up into the final breaks. I shouldn't say roll. You slam violently into the final breaks. <laughs> like, this coaster has so much speed left in it. It is just insane. But yeah, that is the layout of the best coaster in the... At least in the U.S. I'll say that. I... Like I said, I watched a POV of this thing, and I could tell even just from that that there is absolutely no breaks, no gaps in the layout of this ride. The pacing is insane. The transitions just have to, they must whip you all around. It looks so good just from a POV. And I'm saying that because, so me and Gabe have watched POVs before, and they are not the same as riding the roller coaster. They give you a really good idea of what the layout is going to look like on this ride, but it is not anywhere near the level of actually riding the roller coaster. And just watching a POV of this ride, I'm like, I can already tell that if I ride this, it's probably going to shoot to the top of my list and there will be no competition. So... Yes, absolutely. It's just one of those roller coasters that, like I said, is pretty much damn near perfect. And I've said that pretty much about my top four at this point. <laughs> but it, it's, it is, it is, for me, Iron Glossy is exactly what I want in a roller coaster. It is pacing them. It is airtime. It is, you know, creative. Um, you know, I want a coaster that's definitely creative. It only has two inversions, but those two inversions are really, really good. It's got whippy transitions. It's got a awesome first drop, which a coaster must have in my book. For that, I think, for me, it's my number one. I'm sorry, but El Toro is just not on the same level. Uh, well, not right. Any coaster is not on the same level as Iron Gwazi. So... <laughs> You know, for me, this episode's all about Iron Glossy, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just, this is finishing up our top 15, so I have to mention our Toro. And I mean, it made my list at number one at where it did, but it will probably not remain there. And just just doing research into Iron Glossy, I'm like, all right, next roller coaster trip that I plan... I'm freaking getting my butt down there and I'm riding the dang thing because I really, really need to at this point, so. <laughs> but uh, with that, uh, we can talk about next week, next week episode. Um, oh, yeah, this is going to be fun. So we just, <laughs> <laughs> this is, we're calling this week the Battle of the Champions is both mine and game number ones. So we thought next week we'd do the exact opposite and go for absolute battle for last place, our worst roller coasters we've ever ridden. <laughs> this one was a hard one for me. I'm going to be honest. It was a little bit hard for me to pick which one was actually my least favorite. I might have cheated a little bit, but... I think I think I did it justice. I really do. <laughs> uh, those who watch my YouTube channel will probably already be able to guess what coaster or coasters I'll be bringing to the battle for last place. <laughs> well, but uh, yeah, it's gonna be a good one. We've mentioned them in the podcast in one single episode, I think, and <laughs> yeah, a couple a couple of times I think we have, but not on the same level I have mentioned them on my YouTube channel. Okay. So, <laughs> it is well known on my YouTube channel. I hate these roller coasters. So, um, it's not Steel Vengeance, guys. It's not, don't, don't think of Steel Vengeance. It's not that. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's another good one. But no, it's not the worst coaster I've ever ridden, unfortunately. But, <laughs> I have... I have a good one for this episode. So. All right. Everybody join us next week for the battle for last place. <laughs> <laughs>